This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. I should say at the outset, I'm a condensed matter theorist, not a string theorist, which is probably obvious, and if it isn't obvious now, it certainly will be in a few minutes. Um, so could I just take a poll of who is actually a high-energy physicist here, or a string theorist, or a holographer? Can you just put your hands up? So th uh, the vast majority of the audience. So how many are condensed matter physicists? OK, so much... Much fewer, okay. So what I'm going to do is, uh, um, so I'm going to give uh, lectures on what I titled from uh, critical phenomena to holographic duality, uh, well, let's just call it duality in quantum matter, right? And so another term for gauge gravity duality is obviously uh, ADS-CFT, and um, what I wanted to do, just from a condensed matter perspective, uh, was ask a very simple question as to what extent even CFT is useful in condensed matter physics, right? So the whole point of this workshop is to try and uh, explore the possibility that gauge gravity duality has some bearing on condensed matter physics, and if you think about it, at first glance, it's a bit of a stretch, okay? You're gonna take some strongly interacting, maybe supersymmetric field theory, you're gonna then convert it into a theory of gravity, it's got a large number of local degrees of freedom per site, and the question is, does this have any bearing on real condensed matter systems, okay? And I think ultimately the answer will be yes, okay? And I think one aspect that's particularly useful to try and emphasize is that CFT methods and quantum field theory methods in general have been very, very useful in condensed matter physics, okay? And in particular, there are now many beautiful experiments that confirm very directly the relevance of these powerful ideas. And I personally find these experiments uh, and theoretical developments very inspiring because I think ADS-CFT might have uh, a possibility uh, of, of generalizing some of these ideas, okay? That said, the way in which the machinery of ADS-CFT operates is rather different uh, than the way we normally tackle most condensed matter physics problems. And so I think it's worthwhile uh, just to have some orientation of what uh, the utility of CFT has been uh, in condensed matter physics, so that at least you've got some idea of uh, some of the prominent experiments that might actually uh, set a gold standard uh, for potential applications for ADS CFT. Okay, so that's the rationale. Okay, so lecture one then uh, will be relatively basic from a condensed matter point of view, but it's going to be an intro uh, to uh, relativistic QFT and CFT. Okay, in CMT. And as I said, the main motivation was to check, is it actually useful? But also just to point out that there's a lot of historical um, uh, uh, connections between condensed matter physics and high energy physics uh, that really emerge in one plus one dimensions. And so what I want to just convince you of is that actually uh, the stretch to ADS uh, CFT really isn't that big in the grand scheme of things, okay? Um, so then in lecture two, what I will discuss um, is in a sense, how I actually got into this problem, uh, this was actually some work trying to understand uh, the so-called Nernst effect in the cube rates. And there we were trying to understand uh, relativistic quantum transport uh, in two plus one dimensions. Okay. And so many of you will be uh, familiar with the very nice work of Subir and Sean Hartnell, um, where they uh, pointed out that actually ADS-CF2 tools really have uh, a strong impact in this. So hopefully, in some respects, this will be a precursor uh, to Sean's lectures, um, where he uh, really will tell you how things look from an ADS-CFT perspective. Okay? And then in the remaining uh, lecture, what I will do is I will then switch uh, to discuss uh, what I think is an exciting potential area uh, for uh, 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 ADS-CFT, um, which is holographic approaches to far from equilibrium dynamics. Okay? And this is uh, of great interest in condensed matter physics at the moment, um, simply because the number of organizing principles we have uh, for far from equilibrium uh, uh, situations is much less than we have uh, in equilibrium. And the basic question is, are there organizing principles governing uh, non-equilibrium dynamics? Okay? 
And I think one important key word uh, uniting all of these different uh, uh, themes uh, will be universality, right? That's the question. Uh, are there universal overarching features of strongly interacting quantum systems which enable ADS-CFT to have a real quantitative uh, impact both in equilibrium and out of equilibrium? Okay? And so hopefully by uh, tackling, tackling it in this way, uh, I'll try and at least point out what my personal perspective is uh, from a condensed matter point of view. Okay? Uh, I should say, if there's any questions, just interrupt me in real time. Don't wait. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. Okay? okay, so what I'm going to start with uh, is uh, 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 a simple Hamiltonian um, that's been of a lot of interest uh, over the last years, well, many decades, in fact, uh, in condensed matter physics, uh, which is the Heisenberg uh, spin chain. Okay. Sorry, it just keeps going. Okay. So uh, my understanding is that Heisenberg was actually a student uh, at LMU. Okay. So it's actually quite nice uh, to talk about this here. Okay. And it's a relatively simple Hamiltonian to write down, as many of you will know. Okay. Just describing uh, interactions. Uh, between uh, nearest neighbor spins, and uh, for simplicity, I'll assume uh, J is uh, bigger than zero, so that these spins want to anti-align and form an antiferromagnetic ground state, okay? if, if they can. Okay? Now, this has been studied uh, since the 30s, and, or even earlier than that, what makes it complicated is the fact that these spin operators uh, don't commute. Okay, so naively it looks like a very simple Hamiltonian. Okay, um, but the problem is is that the spins uh, don't commute. Okay, okay, and this actually makes it rather complicated to solve. Okay, and what I'm going to do uh, just in this lecture is just talk about the one D. Uh, Hamiltonian, okay? This is actually an exactly uh, solvable problem. Um, I won't really talk about uh, the exact solution. It's, it's somewhat too technically involved. What I'm rather going to do is try and point out the field theory approach to this, and that actually lurking inside this rather innocuous looking Hamiltonian is actually a relativistic Dirac fermion, okay, a bona fide relativistic particle. And that all of the machinery uh, that you're used to in quantum field theory directly applies to this problem. And in fact, the, um, the kind of resulting aspects of CFT um, are rather well understood and directly confirmed by experiment. Okay. And what I'd like to see, if possible, is if uh, a similar level of rigor could actually be brought via the ADS-CFT correspondence to higher dimensional problems for which we just don't have any analytical tools at all. Okay. So usually it's conventional uh, to define, uh, instead of this Hamiltonian, uh, the so-called XXE model. Okay. So that's where you say, well, actually, sometimes uh, it's rather useful to have an additional parameter as a kind of control parameter uh, if you're dealing with a rather complicated problem. Okay? And so this is introduced uh, by the so-called anisotropy. Okay? So this is called delta. Okay? This is the anisotropy parameter. Okay? And we're going to be interested in using this parameter okay, to get some insight into the generic feature of this phase diagram. So ultimately, for an isotropic case, we'll be interested in the situation with delta equals 1. Okay? I'll be able to briefly comment uh, on what happens for delta equals 1. But to be perfectly honest, you would need a couple of lectures to just even go through the field theory aspects associated with that point. Okay? But nonetheless, uh, by studying certain limiting cases of this problem, we'll, we'll be able to see that really uh, these relativistic Dirac fermions are living there, and they're going to have a bearing on the entire phase diagram of this problem. Okay? Okay. So let's start then in a simple limit. Okay? Imagine we make delta uh, very large. Okay? Delta is much, much bigger than 1. Well, all of your spins are going to try and uh, uh, anti-aligned, they want to form a nayel state, okay? So just a simple nayel state, 
But the problem is, is that you've got, uh, for any arbitrary delta, okay, this isn't even going to be a, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay? So even though these spins are wanting to anti-align, okay, quantum fluctuations are going to prevent them doing this. Okay? And what we will see is that, in fact, um, the ground state of this problem has uh, uh, no true long-range order, okay, it actually has uh, what's called quasi-long-range order, it has power law correlations, and this actually leads to conformal field theory describing the ground state properties uh, of this very simple Hamiltonian, okay? Okay, so fine. So how do we uh, go a little bit further? Well, one useful thing that you can do to gain some intuition uh, for what these terms do is to uh, replace uh, Sx and Sy okay, by raising and lowering operators. Okay? So if I make uh, that substitution in the Hamiltonian, okay, we can... Uh, it's very strange, these boards always seem to be in the wrong position. Okay, we can um, recast uh, the Hamiltonian uh, in a form involving uh, the spin flip operators. Okay. Okay. And so what you see is that these terms okay, are trying to flip spins, okay, on adjacent sides, okay? So if you've got a pair of spins, this will try to lower it, this will try to raise it. This is the sense in which these terms try to induce fluctuations into this otherwise very simple nayel state, okay? Bearing in mind we're starting from this limit delta tends to infinity, okay? But the general uh, principle is true um, uh, uh, through quite a large range of this phase diagram, okay? And in fact, uh, one of the first people to point this out was uh, Phil Anderson, actually, okay? And so what he did is he examined uh, the impact of fluctuations around an ordered ground state, okay? And so the way he did this, he used a semi-classical expansion of the spin operators and pointed out that in one dimension, uh, these fluctuations diverge, and in fact, they act uh, in such a strong way that they actually destroy your ordered state, okay? So that's, that's the basic point, okay? So what we want to do then is we want to get a kind of better handle on this kind of problem and the difficulty is that spin operators are a little bit of a pain to deal with, okay? Even though you understand the commutation relations, okay, they're not quite as easy to deal with as fermions and bosons from the perspective of standard tools of quantum field theory, okay? So what we want to do is we want to re replace these uh, spin operators uh, by fermions and bosons, okay? And one hint, uh, well, beg your pardon, just fermions, one um, hint for how we might do this is the fact that these spin operators actually anti-commute, okay? So if you look at the defining relations for S plus and minus, they actually anti-commute, okay? Which says that these spin operators are actually very similar uh, to fermionic creation and annihilation operators, okay? So a naive guess would be that you can define uh, S plus as being C dagger, you can define S minus as being C, and you can define SZ as being C dagger C minus one half, okay? That says that if we have a fermion, uh, it corresponds to spin up. If we don't have a fermion, it corresponds to spin down. And the S plus uh, corresponds to creating a fermion, S minus corresponds to destroying one, okay? The problem is that fermions on different sides anti-commute, okay? Whereas spin operators on different sides commute, okay? So I should add, site labels here. Here I was talking about the on-site commutation relations of the spin operators. But if you're at adjacent sites, uh, the spin operators uh, uh, commute, okay? So you can't just use uh, this straightforward uh, correspondence, okay? Okay. So how do we uh, get around this? Well, there is a kind of important conceptual uh, advance in this regard uh, by Jordan and Wigner. What they said is that basically you need to multiply your operators by a phase. Okay? 
Okay, so we keep the S said, but it's it's really these that are the kind of troublesome uh, factors. Okay, and the problem is this phase turns out to be uh, rather non-trivial. Okay, it's what's known as a Jordan-Wigner string, and uh, it involves a product of uh, the spin operators at all sites to the left of the site in question. Okay. So this is a very highly non-local transformation. Okay? It says that you, know, you, you have some fermion living at this site, okay? but multiplying it is this entire string of operators to the left-hand side. Okay? So your spins are non-local with respect to the fermions, and this actually makes it very technically uh, complicated to do calculations in the fermionic representation. Okay? Nonetheless, there's actually still uh, rather a large amount of information you can get from this, uh, and this is what we're going to uh, discuss. Okay? So just to check, has anybody not seen the jordan Wigner transformation? Just put your hand up. It's not embarrassing if you haven't seen it. So fine. Okay, so, so let's, let's just have a look at this, okay? just to see how this actually uh, assists us. Okay? So... We've got some sites here, i minus 1, site i, site i plus 1, okay? And what we're saying is, actually let me write them down somewhat more explicitly, okay? What we're saying is this spin operator si plus, right, is equal to ci dagger e to the i pi sum over j less than i. This is, I mean, square root of minus 1, okay, not the lattice side, okay? Okay, si minus is the conjugate of this, okay? So it doesn't actually matter where this uh, prefactor goes. You can go on the left or the right. It doesn't matter because it actually commutes through the rest of the operators. And SIZ, uh, as I said, okay, is of this form. Okay, so that's the full non-local jordan Wigner transformation. So what we're trying to do then is we're trying to just look at uh, the commutation relations uh, of two spin operators that live on adjacent sites, okay, si plus, si plus 1 minus, okay, and to demonstrate that they commute, okay. So if we uh, substitute in uh, this Jordan-Wigner transformation, okay, and I'll simplify it and explain what I've binned, okay, in a moment, okay, so it's a commutator, Okay, you get this. Okay, so the basic point is, you imagine you look at a lattice site here, it's got this jordan Wigner string extending all the way down here. This lattice site has this jordan Wigner string acting down here. But when you look at the combination S plus and minus, all of those phase factors cancel out if they're to the left of this point. Okay, so there's just one non-trivial uh, phase factor okay, that's left uh, when you cross-multiply uh, these operators out. Okay? So it's basically keeping track of uh, the number of fermions, if you like, between uh, a generic pair of, of, of spins, okay? So fine, so now what you can do is you can say, well, okay, I mean, you know, this uh, operator, I mean, since we're dealing with uh, fermions, okay? And something I should say that I didn't stress at the outset is that these are spinless fermions, okay? There's no index, okay? So they either zero or one uh, per site, and so, as a result, if you look at this, if this is either 0 or 1, okay, it can only be uh, uh, plus or minus 1. And so, um, you can readily uh, recast this operator okay, in the following form. Okay. And the basic point is that if you now uh, 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 look at this combination and just use the standard fermionic commutation relations, you should be able to convince yourself that this is zero. Okay? So the action of multiplying uh, by these phase operators gives you the correct commutation relations. Okay? So this is just a very simple example of why condensed matter physicists are actually very used to mapping one problem into another. Right? As long as it becomes easier to analyze in the new representation, that's perfectly fine. Okay. The slight difference uh, from ADS-CFT, though, is that here we're starting from an explicit Hamiltonian, and we're going to be able to carry through all of the different mappings. Okay. 
from ADS-CFT, this might not be possible, okay? You've certainly got a dictionary that enables you to recast uh, physical observables on the boundary theory and relate them to gravitational observables, but you don't necessarily know what the Hamiltonian is, okay? So we're going to have to try and understand various overarching features of these problems in order to try and make uh, contact with uh, a condensed matter experiment. Okay. Are there any questions about Jordan Wigner? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so what do we want to use this for, right? So what we want to use it for uh, is to try and look at this Heisenberg model, okay? And in particular, if we uh, make this mapping uh, to, the, to these uh, terms Si plus, okay, uh, Si uh, minus, okay, the first terms in this Hamiltonian, okay, up there, then we can write this in terms of this phase operator as follows. And the basic point is, is that uh, most of the uh, terms in the product of these strings cancel out. And again, we're just left with one um, uh, factor left over uh, coming from the site i. Okay? This involves a product uh, of sites less than i. This involves a product uh, less than i plus 1. So you've just got one phase factor left over. Okay? And so since this operator can only act on a state that already has a fermion, okay, it means that um, uh, uh, this has to be an empty site, I beg your pardon, in order for it to act non-trivially. So this phase factor is actually effectively unity. Okay? Right? And similarly, what you can convince yourselves is that if you look at the other term that we need uh, in the jordan wigner transformation, okay, and use also the fermionic anti-commutation relations, that also simplifies. Okay? So this is basically the job done in a sense, essentially, right? because what we're going to be able to do now is look at this uh, problem that's actually a magnet as a problem of uh, interacting uh, fermions. Okay? So if I just rewrite this Heisenberg-Hamiltonian, then what you see is that this first term, this S plus S minus term, this corresponds to fermionic hopping. Okay? You destroy a fermion at a given lattice site, it moves to the next site, uh, and similarly you have the uh, Hermitian conjugate process uh, describing these uh, fermionic hopping. Okay? So the fermion hops from one site to the other. So this is a, a kinetic term for a fermionic lattice model. Okay? This, on the other hand, uh, is an interaction between these fermions, okay? And actually, this is why uh, the Heisenberg problem in general uh, is so complicated, because you have to take into account, uh, in the isotropic case, for the presence of these interactions uh, between fermions. Okay, sorry, I, I lost the sight later. Okay. So the obvious trick, then, uh, is to just start the discussion from the point... Uh, where delta equals zero, okay, the so-called xy point, because you just look at uh, the symmetry in the xy plane and you bin uh, the z parts, and that actually gives you a lot of intuition about uh, the generic structure of the phase diagram. Okay, is that okay so far? So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, immediately uh, go from this position space uh, into uh, Fourier space and just recast this as a bunch of interacting uh, fermions. And I should just also mention that in the earlier lecture, uh, Professor uh, Takinagi uh, talked about uh, the Ising model. This is another classic spin problem in condensed matter physics uh, that can also be tackled in precisely the same way. Uh, it's discussed in uh, Sue Beer's book on uh, quantum phase transitions. And uh, again, it forms a kind of uh, benchmark for trying to understand the interacting quantum systems uh, in general. Okay. okay, so what we want to do then uh, is to uh, move into uh, Fourier space. Okay. So if I introduce uh, 
Fourier basis uh, for my creation and annihilation operators. Okay. Then, in terms of those, if I take that lattice model, okay, I can write it in a very simple way. And as I said, if we neglect delta, okay, we get rid of this quartic interaction uh, between the fermions. And what we're left with is uh, a problem of essentially free fermions okay, uh, moving through this uh, type binding lattice with a cosinusoidal uh, dispersion. Okay? And so the way uh, in which uh, relativistic field theory uh, comes in is that when we look at uh, the occupation of the, the states uh, in momentum state space, um, the ground state uh, is only going to fill the momentum states up to a certain level. And if we linearize around this point, uh, we're going to see uh, an emergent Lorentz invariant. Okay. So if we just uh, plot the energy versus momentum right, for this cosine band, okay, what we're saying is this is E versus K. This is our dispersion. Okay, goes up to J and minus J. Okay. And if we want the ground state uh, of this magnet in this fermionic representation, it says we should make the energy as negative as possible, i.e., let's fill all the states from minus pi to pi, okay, and this will be our ground state of our magnet, okay. So this is effectively the Fermi energy, okay, you could also translate this portion of the dispersion uh, via 2 pi, and it would come over here like this, okay. So these are going to correspond to left-moving Dirac fermions, and these are going to correspond to right-moving Dirac fermions. When you look at the low energy properties uh, of this system, okay. But here we actually have the explicit expression for the dispersion, okay. So it's actually possible uh, to do rather a lot uh, of work with this Hamiltonian without actually linearizing, okay? And in particular, if you look at thermodynamic quantities, you can see that in the low temperature limit, uh, the uh, resulting uh, free energy gives you a specific heat that corresponds to the specific heat of a relativistic fermion or uh, equivalently uh, a relativistic boson, okay? So let's have a look at uh, how we might get some insight into kind of correlation functions and averages and magnetizations. Okay? So we have this uh, relationship uh, between uh, the magnetization and uh, the fermions from the jordan wigner transformation. So what this says is that if we're at half filling, okay, which is what we are, we're dealing with spinless electrons, and in order to get the ground state, we've just filled up to these points here, so we have a half filled band. What it says is this ground state has vanishing Z component of the magnetization. Okay? So it's not an or a magnetically ordered state okay, with a broken uh, symmetry. Okay? Similarly, if we look at uh, the expectation values of SX, uh, and SY, okay, these are also zero because I can recast this in terms of the uh, uh, raising and lowering operators. And if I act with a raising operator uh, on this uh, fermionic C and promote one of the particles above the surface, then this is going to be orthogonal uh, to the state on the other side, okay? So this is already the first hint that from the point of view of magnetism, uh, the state at delta equals zero is, is, is somewhat unusual. Okay. okay. So let's, let's try and get a handle on this. 
Are there any questions about that? Okay, so the next thing I want to try and understand then uh, is correlation functions. Okay, I've skipped over uh, a bit where we just look at the uh, energy of the system, okay, which we can do by just integrating over this uh, dispersion and just seeing how much energy uh, our fermions have. Okay. So if we want to look at, for example, uh, the ZZ component of of the correlation function, okay, so with the n, okay, then if we use uh, this Jordan Wigner relation, okay, okay, then uh, we can immediately uh, uh, simplify this uh, using the known properties of these fermions. And in this half-filled band, these terms uh, give a, uh, a quarter. This gives a quarter. It cancels out uh, that term. So we have this quartic operator in terms of fermions uh, minus uh, this little bit. Okay? And since these are uh, free fermions, you can just use uh, Wick's theorem uh, to contract these operators. Okay? There's two distinct ways uh, that you can contract these non-trivially. Okay? And so, for example, uh, you can see that uh, as a result of this, um, that the uh, correlation function um, okay. And so if you set m equals to n, okay, then you just uh, find that s n z all squared. Uh, is a quarter, uh, which is what you would expect uh, for spin a half. Okay, so if this was a vector, uh, total s squared uh, would be three quarters, uh, reflecting uh, the three components of spin. Okay, but more generally, what you want to do is you want to be able to uh, understand uh, the uh, the full spatial dependence of this correlation function, and in particular to see uh, the connections uh, to conformal field theory. Sorry, this is going on. Okay, so in order to kind of understand that in more detail, what you have to do is you basically have to uh, Fourier transform uh, these operators uh, and to uh, uh, go into momentum space, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip uh, the details of that and actually just uh, state what the answer is, okay? equal to m. So what that means is if you set uh, one of these uh, to zero, okay, and just look at how it drops off as a function of distance, what you find is that uh, these uh, correlation functions go down like the square of the distance. Okay? Okay. So they're alternating in sign. Okay? If you look at first guy, then the third, then the fifth, etc. Okay, there's a minus sign reflecting the fact that this is an anti-ferromagnet. But rather crucially, the spin-spin correlation functions decay as 1 over n squared at this particular point where delta equals 0. Okay? And the correlations between sites that are evenly spaced actually vanishes. Okay? So it's quite an unusual kind of magnetic state. Okay? 
So this is where you start to see the hints that CFT can play a role because systems with power law uh, behavior in one plus one dimensions can be described uh, by CFT. Okay? And so what it means is that this, mag this magnet is an antiferromagnet. It has some alternating magnetic order okay, that alternates in sign. If you look at uh, the behavior in the vicinity of wave vectors close to pi, corresponding to this antiferromagnetic oscillation, your magnetic system should be described by a gapless conformal field theory. Okay? And what we'll see in a little while is that experimentally this is indeed the case. And in fact, this actually exists all the way up to the uh, isotropic point where we set delta equals uh, 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 unity. Okay. okay. So the other thing you can prove, uh, although it's rather technically uh, difficult, so I won't do it here, okay? this is actually uh, some work done by McCoy, okay? is that if you want to understand uh, the uh, correlation functions in either the x or the y direction, these actually drop off as the square root of the distance. Okay? And this is because we set delta equals to zero, so x, y, and z are not appearing on an equal footing. And in general, these uh, exponents uh, don't have to be the same. Okay? But nonetheless, the theory is still uh, described by uh, conformal field theory. Okay? So how are we doing for time? Okay, let's have a look. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, it's, where does it come from? Oops. Yes, so, so this is, there is a minus one to the n, okay? Um, basically, when you do the Fourier transform, uh, which I skipped over, in simplifying these uh, expressions, you get a factor e to the i k n minus one. Sorry, which? Here or there? No, no, so it's because I've set one to zero, and then it's alternating because I go from site one to three to five. I... So if that was zero, right? n is always odd. Yeah. So then, it's always the same sign. yeah, it's always the same sign. So if you take a spin and look at it two neighbors away, uh, or one neighbor away, okay, but then three, five, okay, there's a relative minus sign just reflecting the antiferromagnetism. The one at zero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, Okay. so fine. Um, so let's have a look. So we started at five. Okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll actually uh, uh, just give the details for how you see uh, one extra quantity, which is uh, the central charge that was mentioned uh, by Professor Takinagi in the beginning. Um, so if you look at... Uh, the free energy uh, of this system, okay. which we can now compute uh, because we have the exact uh, dispersion, right? The free energy is basically given uh, by this relativistic, or this, beg your pardon, this tight binding uh, dispersion, okay? And um, what we want to do is we want to uh, integrate over this bunch of fermions okay, with uh, a Fermi uh, distribution, but with the dispersion given by this J cos K okay, that we found uh, by the explicit fermionization. Okay? And so the point is, is that if you uh, uh, look at the corresponding internal energy okay, as a function of temperature, Okay. where T uh, I've defined as being KBT over J. Okay. The basic point is, is that this uh, correction to the ground state energy okay, actually goes as T squared. Okay. And so one of the things we heard about uh, in John's talk this morning um, was that you know, if you have 
uh, a gapless system in d plus 1 dimensions, uh, then the uh, internal energy goes as t to the d plus 1. Okay? So this prefactor is proportional to the central charge in 1 plus 1 dimensions. And so if you compare this uh, with the results of Cardi uh, and Ian Affleck, who uh, pointed out that actually uh, the central charge is related to uh, the specific heat capacity and therefore the linear uh, temperature derivative of this term, you basically discover that the central charge is equal to unity. Okay? So just to summarize, in this magnet there lives a relativistic CFT with central charge 1, okay, that you can describe uh, by a relativistic Dirac fermion. Okay? So what I want to do is just show you uh, some experimental data that helps to uh, support this. Okay? So let me turn this on. Okay, so the first thing is, um, if you do numerical simulations on this spin chain, okay, what you see is that here uh, is being computed uh, an effective central charge. Okay? So uh, we heard from uh, Professor Takinagi's lectures that if we're in a 1 plus 1 dimensional relativistic CFT, then our uh, uh, entanglement entropy scales as a logarithm of the system size, of the uh, uh, block size, okay? And this prefactor you can get at using uh, what's called density matrix renormalization group, okay? So if you imagine you're interested in some condensed matter problem, you're interested in trying to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian or correlations in this Hamiltonian, you want some numerical procedure that gives you access to the density matrix but also enables you to tease out out the appropriate low energy physics. So it's some density matrix renormalization group procedure. And in fact, I think ADS CFT actually has quite a lot of uh, potential to offer interesting benchmarks for future numerical experiments. Okay? You see, here, what you're doing is you're looking at this effective central charge, and you see that as you increase the system size, okay, then it approaches what you expect in the thermodynamic limit. And that over at this point, okay, which actually corresponds to delta equals minus 1, which we haven't discussed yet, you can see something else is going on. Okay? And the point of this recent paper was to point out that even in this very well understood uh, problem, actually there's some new features emerging uh, close to delta equals minus 1 okay, uh, that can be revealed through looking at entanglement entropy. Okay? So although it maybe seems like an abstract uh, quantity to look at in the first instance, it can tell you uh, about the phase diagram of this XXZ Hamiltonian. Okay? And actually, if you look at uh, the phase diagram, okay, this is described by a gapless CFT. Okay? This is a ferromagnetic phase, and this is trying to be an antiferromagnet if delta was much, much larger than 1. And there are transitions then occurring at these two special points. Okay? And what they've done in these numerics, uh, they're looking at delta plus 1 because they're trying to focus in on what happens near this point to try and learn something new uh, about the transition uh, between this CFT and this ferromagnetic phase. Okay? So I didn't say this, but here is where we did all of our explorations. Okay? We found a 1 over distance squared decay of the ZZ correlators, and we found a 1 over root distance decay uh, in the xy plane, but generically if you change delta, these exponents vary continuously throughout this phase, okay? And actually you need to move quite a bit of technical machinery to tease these things out, um, but they're all known, okay? So the point is, is that uh, here uh, you're seeing uh, the emergence of this central charge uh, in numerical experiments, okay? Is it possible to turn the lights back off? Cheers, thanks. <laughs> 
Okay. So, yeah, question. Yeah. So this is all described by what's called a Luttinger liquid. I'll come back to this, okay, if, we, if we've got time. So the point is, is that there's, uh, very crudely speaking, let me, let me do it in Lorentz invariant uh, form. You have some uh, free boson with a parameter uh, uh, k out of the front. This is a so-called Luttinger liquid parameter. And what you know is that um, uh, if you look at uh, fields, say, of the form e to the i phi, e to the minus i phi, these drop off as some power law with distance where the decay depends on this coefficient. So the point is, what we did is we worked very hard to understand this point delta equals zero. To understand delta away from zero, you have to put back those interactions between the free fermions. And what I didn't discuss here was the techniques for how you actually do the linearization. Right? So what did we see? We, we fermionized this problem. We got a problem of spinless fermions. And we have this Fermi C that's filled up to a certain momentum. Okay? And the value of that momentum is determined by the fact that in order to be a ground state, we wanted to minimize the energy. So there's a preferred filling for this problem. So if you ask about low energy excitations in the vicinity of this point, these lattice fermions you can recast as left and right components of a Dirac fermion. And then you can move the entire machinery uh, that was developed by uh, Sidney Coleman uh, in noting the equivalence between the massive Thiering model and the sine gordon model to recast these fermionic bilinears okay, in terms of a boson. And the upshot of all of these manipulations is you develop a non-trivial parameter known as the Luttinger parameter that governs the decay of the correlation functions as you go through this phase. Okay? If you look at the x, x, y, y, z, z correlators, the point is, is that at this point, they have to drop off in the same way. Okay? They drop off as one over distance. And what's not apparent from the analysis that I've done, okay, which, which can be done, is at this point, where you put the... Uh, the, uh, uh, all the spin components on an equal footing is actually described by uh, a rather sophisticated uh, conformal field theory uh, known as an SU2 level 1 westermino witten model. Yeah. westermino novikov witten okay. So this was something pointed out by Ian Affleck, okay, because this is some free boson okay, that you can use to describe the behavior of correlations in this Luttinger liquid regime. But at this isotropic point, you've lost the SU2 invariance. Okay? So if you ask, what conformal field theory could you write down that was SU2 invariant, okay? the natural object to write down uh, in the first instance would be something like a nonlinear sigma model. Okay? You say that you have some matrix field uh, G that's a member of SU2, and you try to write uh, something uh, like a kinetic term uh, for this object, okay? But then the problem is, is that um, this model is actually not a conformal field theory, and in order to get a conformal field theory, okay, you need to add what's called the topological term, okay, uh, to this model, okay? And so I've been very sloppy over uh, normalizations, okay? So they can all be worked out, but the point is, is that if this parameter k uh, is set equal to unity, uh, this uh, corresponds to what's known as the SU2 level 1 West Amino model. Okay? And so this level 1 is actually related to twice the spin, and we're dealing with a spin a half problem. Okay? Right, so yeah. in the end, uh, at all those points, yeah. you're gaining, uh, so this is a critical phase? It's a critical phase. Well, it depends whether you regard changing this parameter as being a different CFT. But I'm asking different, different in the basic sense. So, so the CFT, they have, so all, all the components, they, they have the same temperature, but different scaling. But different scaling dimensions, yeah. So, so in that sense, it, it's different at every point, okay? But, but I think I'd rather say that it's basically described by a free boson, and the decay of these correlation functions is a function of this coupling. Okay, and so much the scaling dimensions. But the central charge remains unity. Okay? So you see, what you've discovered here is that the central charge is unity. 
And so if you were to repeat this numerical experiment anywhere in this phase, you would see that you've got a CFT. Okay? And so that's also something that's just worth remarking, right? Because if we started here, okay, and just took this simple Heisenberg antiferromagnetine 1D, we didn't go out of our way to tune a phase transition to get that critical state. That is the ground state of the 1D uh, system. Okay? And so this will crop up then when we start to analyze neutron scattering data, which I'll try and show you. Okay? Are, are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, very crudely, I mean, here, what you, it, so the question is, what is actually happening when you go to this point? Because when you hit delta equals to minus one, you're also, uh, in some sense, changing the chemical potential for the fermions, okay? So, indeed, all of these things are in there, and so then you depopulate the seed, you're magnetized all uniformly, okay? So, if you go back to the Hamiltonian um, over here... Uh, delta uh, is in front of this Ising term. What he's saying is when delta becomes negative and bigger than these coefficients, it tries to form a ferromagnetic state. Okay? On the other side, when delta equals plus one and it's large, this is trying to be antiferromagnetic, but it turns out that the staggered magnetization, i.e., if you look at the magnetization at each site but include an alternating minor site, that actually doesn't commute with the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So what it tells you is that even though it wants to be uh, a nice antiferromagnet, it can't do it, okay? At delta equals uh, uh, infinity, it, it can do it. But to understand this, you still have some uh, quantum fluctuations in the ground state, okay? And so this is in some sense why, um, you know, these problems are rather complicated to analyze on the lattice, okay? You have to be an expert in the Beth Anzats, but you can get some entry points into the phase behavior uh, of these interacting quantum systems using field theory techniques, okay? And using standard field theory techniques now, okay? Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. Uh, how do I get that? Just turn this on. So one thing that, you know, people doing numerical simulations would love to be able to do is, cranking is uh, numerical simulations uh, in 2D, right? And actually, results for entanglement in 2D could be important future benchmark, okay? Okay, good. Uh, and the other thing that I, I should also point out as well is that, I mean, it was also mentioned uh, uh, in the, the talk before, that, you know, these are very good for looking for phase transitions, they're particularly good in situations where you don't know the order parameter, okay? Sorry, the bottom, I think, actually gets locked off when the uh, board is in place, okay? Uh, sorry? Okay, sorry, I thought I, I, I couldn't... I, I, it doesn't seem to want to go... It stops there. Yeah, so it's okay. So, um, so just another remark. You know, very often in a condensed matter setting, okay, and maybe even in an ADS-CFT setting, if you're trying to understand the phase diagram of a complicated interacting system, you might not know what the order parameter is in advance, particularly if it's a topological theory, okay? So it would be interesting uh, to look at holographic models and use the entanglement entropy as a diagnostic to explore phases and phase transitions within the context of ADS-CFT. So I don't know to what extent that program's uh, been carried out, but it's interesting, okay? So this was also just to point out another thing. I mean, so we don't have to go through this, but, you know, we worked out the thermodynamics of this problem, and we pointed out that, you know, if you look at the low temperature behavior of this problem, uh, it descri it's described by CFT. And so what this means is that in addition to looking at uh, entanglement entropy, you can look at the, uh, basically the finite temperature corrections to the ground state energy, or the finite size scaling, as it used to be called. Okay, so before the advent of entanglement entropy methods, people used to look at finite size effects in these kind of spin chains uh, to try and understand the ground state properties, okay? And again, you see that this uh, converges uh, to C equals 1, okay? Okay, so let's, let's talk a bit about experiment then, right? So what we want to look at then is what, how these features manifest themselves if you do a real experiment uh, 
on a quasi one dimensional spin chain. Okay? And the reason uh, it's quasi one dimensional is because obviously you have some real material. So the best you can do is to have some very anisotropic uh, interactions along one of the chain uh, directions. Okay? So here it's dropped off uh, the board, so I can't actually see the answers myself. Okay, so the in chain interaction is about 34 milli electron volts, whereas it's minus 1.6 in these uh, transverse directions. So to a good approximation, this is a bunch of weakly coupled 1D spin chains. Okay? So fine. So now you say, well, OK, what do the excitations look in this uh, spin chain? Okay? And a very simple cartoon is that um, if you imagine that you send in some neutron and try to flip a spin, okay, this is some antiferromagnet, okay, and we've already said that this is a cartoon for the ground state, but, you know, still we're trying to get as far as we can with some simple ideas. So if you flip one of these spins, okay, what happens is you form a domain wall, okay, between these adjacent spins, which is annoying for the system because it wants to be an antiferromagnet, so it flips the spin and tries to send the domain wall further out. So what it says is that in this magnet, even though you flipped one spin, okay, and you would naively expect uh, the particles to have spin one, actually you don't make a spin one particle, you make two spin a half particles. Okay? So this is what's known as fractionalization. Okay? It says that the elementary excitations in a quantum many body system may be very, very different than your constituent particles. And in this case, uh, their domain walls are kind of topological objects interpolating between different ground states. Um, that are, are rather unusual, okay? So this was pointed out uh, by uh, Fadeev and Taktajan, who there's a kind of famous paper called What is the Spin of a Spin Wave? And so what you expect then is that if you look at sending in some neutron, okay, and this neutron's going to come in, it's going to lose some energy and transfer some momentum to the system, okay? What you expect is that um, if you transfer uh, a certain amount of momentum, there's going to be different ways of distributing this energy between these spin-ons, as they call it. Okay? You're going to produce these particles in pairs. Okay? So these particles are produced in pairs, and so they live in this so-called two-spin-on continuum, and these boundaries uh, can be obtained uh, from the beth -Anzat, Okay, They're known as uh, a kind of lower spin-on uh, boundary, an upper spin-on uh, boundary. But what I want to emphasize is what you see is here, okay, this state goes gapless, close to Q equals pi. Okay? Q is the momentum transferred in the direction of the chain. So this corresponds to antiferromagnetism, okay? because it's alternating from each site. This corresponds to uh, ferromagnetic order. Okay? But all of the action is basically happening for the antiferromagnetic correlations. And so this regime is described by an SU2 level 1 Wessamino novikov witten model with a topological term. Okay? which is needed to make it gapless, and that if you know how to compute the correlation functions in this model, okay, which you can do if you know the operator content and the scaling dimensions, if you Fourier transform that correlation function, you will find how this decays as a function of energy close to this point. Okay? And so this is actual neutron scattering data. Okay? Uh, done by Bella Lake and co-workers, where you see, indeed, you have uh, this large amount of spectral weight, okay, building up close to this lower spin-on boundary, okay? And what's interesting is that um, this behavior exists over, a, a, you know, very broad range of temperatures, okay? But, of course, if you zoom in at very low temperatures, you start to see that, actually, uh, some of this spectral weight is depleted, Corresponding to the fact that in a real material, okay, you have uh, interchain interactions which drive you away from this critical point. Okay? What's the color? So this is basically the intensity in arbitrary scattering units. So they're looking at the number of neutrons kicked into their detector with certain energy and momentum, and this is related to the Fourier transform, essentially, of the spin-spin correlation function. It's a little bit more complicated because, you know, you've got to think about the fact that these are actually copper atoms, so they have some non-trivial distribution of electrons uh, in the atoms. There's some form factors, um, but it's basically the, the neutron scattering intensity. Okay. okay. So you see 
what they have is they have this nice regime, okay, which is at intermediate energies, okay, where you're free from any problems associated with interchain coupling, where you're described by this uh, 1D Luttinger liquid or essentially this free boson. So you're seeing uh, scaling behavior here. At very high energies, you start to notice the fact that actually you're on a lattice. Okay? So the point I want to drive home is that this 1D behavior is seen in these materials. And so if you look at the data, actually let, let me just go back. I mean, what they're doing is they're saying, let's look at these plots right, as a function of temperature. This is 6 Kelvin, the lowest temperature. That's where you start to see significant depletion around here because you're noticing the small interchain interactions. At higher temperatures, you're less susceptible to this, so it, it behaves more like a 1D system. And so if you look uh, at this point, this uh, k equals pi, where you're governed by this CFT, you should be able to collapse your data and see scaling as a function of omega over t. Okay? So one of the things that Sue Beer pointed out uh, quite a long time ago is that if you're close to a quantum critical point, the only scale in the problem is temperature, and therefore you expect scaling as a function of energy over temperature. Okay? And so if you uh, collapse their data, okay, so they have to look at the temperature times this thing, that's the quantity that scales, you see that all of the data collapses very nicely as a function of E over T, and this is a theoretical curve Okay, that was predicted by Heinz Schultz from Luttinger liquid theory. Okay, so this is absolutely bulletproof evidence that CFT has an impact on these real materials, and actually it can be a rather interesting uh, way to understand uh, the broader phase diagrams in these systems. Okay, and so. Um, in addition, if they look at lower energies, they can see that they see a crossover to this ordered phase where the spin-on excitations in this Luttinger liquid get confined back into spin-1 magnets. Okay? So there's a kind of confinement, deconfinement, uh, let's say crossover, if not transition, occurring in these uh, materials. Okay? But again, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that if you just look at the quality of that data, okay, to the theoretical predictions. It's very, very impressive. Okay? And so I think if ADS-CFT has the potential to organize uh, 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 experiments done on strongly correlated systems to the same degree, it will be an unequivocal success. Okay? And obviously there's many difficulties in that because you don't necessarily know what the Hamiltonian of the boundary theory is but from the perspective of scaling and phenomenology and trying to kind of uh, understand relationships between either transport properties or magnetic properties or whatever in different materials there might be some hope to actually get results of a similar quality okay but it's clearly going to be harder okay okay so then um, how am I doing so I'm nearly off aren't I okay I started at quarter past, so, so I've got till... Okay, okay, so that's fine. So, okay, so, so then just to show you just another amusing thing, I mean, some of you may have uh, heard this. I mean, all the stuff I talked about was uh, associated with this spinner half chain. So the spinner half chain has these gapless excitations known as spin-ons that's described by conformal field theory. Uh, if you look at an integer spin chain, okay, you see that this, what was gapless behavior occurring near Q equals pi, has developed an excitation gap. But in addition, there's a nice smooth curve here, right? You're just producing a single particle. You're not producing spin-ons. So it says that when you go from a half integer to an integer spin, okay, the excitations in this correlated system change in a very dramatic way, okay? And so this is sometimes known as the Haldane gap. Okay, who pointed out basically the role of these topological type terms depends on twice the spin. Okay? And so in these uh, integer spin chains, you can neglect these topological terms, uh, whereas in the half integer uh, case, they're absolutely crucial uh, in order to see the dynamics. I saw you wincing. Yeah. <laughs> Why were you wincing? Come back to it. <laughs> Okay. I was chatting last night to John about uh, 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 trying to understand such problems semi-classically, and I think John thinks he can understand them without doing semi-classics, which is very good. So, okay. <laughs>
so what I just want to kind of round up with is just um, uh, an extra set of experiments that again show very, very close connections to CFT, but actually go way beyond CFT in a sense, okay? They show you what happens if you perturb CFTs and the fact that you can get incredibly exotic behavior that again is, is clearly seen in experiments, okay? So there's a very famous uh, prediction uh, by Sasha Zamolodikov that if you look at the Ising model in a magnetic field, okay, and this Ising model is close to its phase transition, then this continuum Hamiltonian turns out to be integrable. Okay? It's worth pointing out the Ising model on the lattice is not exactly solvable, okay? but somehow close to the continuum limit, when you look at this problem as a perturbed CFT, it turns out that out of the infinite conservation laws that are appropriate for this CFT, this perturbation reduces that number of conserved quantities down to a rather large number of conserved quantities to the extent that there is a residual E8 symmetry. Okay? This Lie algebra has 248 generators. Okay? I mean, this is the Ising model in a magnetic field. Okay? This isn't you know, string theory, right? I mean, this is literally a magnet, okay? And the masses of these excitations, okay? So this is a gapless theory, but in the presence of this, it's driven to some massive integrable, conform uh, integrable field theory. The masses are predicted, and they're uh, related to the dinking diagram of this uh, emergent E8 spectrum. And so there's very clear predictions for what the masses of these mesons is. Right? So you imagine that this uh, spin-a-half magnet, it has uh, these uh, kind of spin-on-like excitations, these domain wall excitations. What it says is that in the presence of this magnetic field, you expect to confine them. Okay? And there's some very uh, beautiful experiments done by uh, Radu Kaldea, where first of all, he looks at the criticality in an Ising model, but then switches on this field. Okay? So... The Hamiltonian is, is, is very simple. So you have a bunch of spin operators uh, interacting, uh, in this case, ferromagnetically. And this is called the transverse field, right? So just ignore this last term for the time being. This transverse field uh, is in the x direction and so annoys the magnetic order in the z direction because it doesn't commute with it. And so if you tune this parameter hx, okay, then you can go from an ordered phase uh, to a, uh, a paramagnetic phase, okay? And so you've got to be careful again in these uh, real systems because they have interchain interactions. So actually what they look at here is the full 3D ordered moment, but nonetheless, they can get rid of this ordered moment by applying a transverse field, okay? So this is a magnet in his lab. He tunes it up to five Tesla and you go through this phase transition, okay, that we saw uh, in Professor Takinagi's talk that you can see by entanglement entropy, okay? So this has been known for a long time uh, by all sorts of different techniques, but here you're seeing it experimentally. Very good. So now what do you want to do? You want to try and apply a longitudinal field, okay? And it turns out that we have a very nice source of that longitudinal field, right? Because basically because the chains are interacting, okay, there's, there's uh, nearest neighbor chains and they all want to point in the same way in this case, as a result of interchain interactions, there is an effective magnetic field acting on this system. Okay? And so what you expect then is that this magnetic field is going to induce confinement and you're going to see bound states. Okay? So we'll get to that in a moment. This was just to show uh, what this data looks like. So if you uh, tune this transverse field that's tuning your quantum phase transition, you see that um, you go from having this broad continuum of excitations corresponding to these pairs of domain walls forming in this Ising antiferromagnet, Ising ferromagnet, I beg your pardon, to uh, a somewhat sharper feature occurring on the other side, okay, when these excitations are no longer the elementary excitations in that phase, okay? So this is experimental evidence for the Ising phase transition, okay? But now you want to look at confinement. So what I'm showing here is the neutron data taken at 5 Kelvin. Okay, this is above the ordering transition, so you see this nice um, uh, 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 continuum of excitations. Okay? I should say that they're very 
uh, deep in this ordered phase, so they're not applying uh, this magnetic field. Okay, so they, they're not going to the critical point here, they're just looking deep in the ordered phase. And as they cool it down to 40 millikelvin, they see these discrete bumps appearing. Okay? So these are not the Zamalogikov bound state, okay? because we haven't tuned to the critical point yet. Okay? Zamalogikov looks at a perturbed CFT. Okay? So the physics of this is that when you have um, your uh, uh, chains okay, next to each other, okay, you can imagine that if you want to create a spin-on, okay, which is this spin-flipped excitation that's moving out, okay, what it feels is a linear confinement potential okay, due to the other chains. Okay? And so as a result, these uh, kink-like excitations are actually confined by a linear potential. And if you solve the, linear Schro the Schrodinger equation in a linear potential, you found this bound state. And these bound states occur at basically the zeros of the airy function. And what you see is that these uh, discrete bunch of peaks, okay, mass 1, mass 2, mass 3, is a function of the energy that you send in via your neutrons, corresponds to this simple linear confinement model. Okay? So now, if you uh, tune up this transverse magnetic field and go to uh, the critical point, you should be able to see these bound states corresponding to the E8 mass spectrum. Okay? And it turns out that it's difficult to resolve the higher bound states because one of the things you have to ask when you're doing these neutron scattering measurements is not only how much energy does it cost to produce one of these meson-like excitations, but how much energy does it cost to make two. Okay? And so some of these uh, 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 higher uh, E8 states actually occur in this so-called two-particle continuum. Okay? So they're a little bit buried. Okay? But nonetheless, there's a clear prediction for what the ratio of the two masses should be, the lowest two masses, as you go through this critical point, and it approaches the golden ratio. And indeed, you see these masses approach the golden ratio. So this is experimental evidence of this E8 algebra in a magnetic system. You have quark, in quotes, confinement, okay? all understood using perturbed CFT. Okay? So let me skip over this uh, during the time. It was just to point out that obviously you know, there's been a lot of activity in the last few years looking at graphene, okay, where again you have this uh, relativistic spectrum. And in fact, there's an effective speed of light. Uh, uh, it's about 1 times 10 to 6 meters per second. And um, you see the relativistic version of the quantum Hall effect at room temperature. Okay, essentially in pencil lead. Okay. So, okay, so why have I shown you all of these things? Well, what I just want to kind of emphasize is that relativistic QFT really does play an important role in condensed matter physics. But actually, it's not only important, it's experimentally verifiable and actually leads to many, many exotic and unusual effects. And the basic question is, are there similar things out there regarding 2D CFTs, perturbed 2D CFTs, that you might be able to get a handle on using ADS-CFT. Okay? And it might take a few years before you can even dream of comparing uh, to experimental uh, situations like that. But I think, you know, depending on what your background is, that should be the ultimate goal. Okay? And so in the next um, lectures, I will talk about a couple of directions that I think are particularly interesting, just because on the condensed matter side, um, it was somewhat harder uh, to understand these problems. So the first one was relativistic transport in 2 plus 1D uh, that Sean will talk a lot about in his lectures. Uh, and then the last one is, is far from equilibrium dynamics. What happens if you really start to kick these systems? Can we get any uh, universal principles? So I'll end there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, in the case of, so here you're deep in this ordered phase. So you haven't applied this transverse field to go to the critical point. In that regime, it turns out it's a kind of weak confinement regime. 
you can think about this in terms of a kind of semi-classical type picture of confinement. And basically, the energy cost for, you see, the, you imagine you've got this ferromagneticizing chain, you flip one of the spins, this propagates out, and it leaves behind, okay, these flipped spins uh, in its wake, okay? The energy cost for having those flip spins is linear as a function of the interchain interactions. It's because this is opposite to that, and so it, it costs you linearly, okay? And so if you then look just phenomenologically at the uh, bound states that form in a linear potential, uh, you can demonstrate that they're governed by the airy function. And so these masses uh, of these excitations reflect that linear confinement potential, okay? So the potential's more complicated when you go over to the, the perturbed critical point, so the perturbizing model uh, described by CFT, and there you get this E8 mass spectrum, uh, which clearly doesn't correspond to a simple linear potential. So there's something more complicated, but it's something that you can get hold of using techniques of integrable field theory. Okay? And so, you know, it, it's not exclusively the case, right? But, I mean, by and large, most of our exactly solvable models are in 1D, okay? I was talking to, to John about this uh, uh, yesterday. I mean, there are examples of solvable models in, in 2D, no, no question, okay? But they're much fewer and far between, okay? In 1D, you've got a whole slew of machinery that you can use to, inter to, to understand these interacting quantum systems and really constrain the behavior, okay? And so ADS-CFT might be useful uh, in particular in, in going into higher dimensions. Okay, so they're not necessarily integrable, okay, but they are solvable. Ooh, I don't think so because the problem is, is that um, you you're not generically um, integral. Let, let me have a think. So. Um, there is work done by uh, Giuseppe Massado on double sign Gordon, for example. Um, so there is, yes, so, so let me approach it differently. So in a sense, what you ask is, imagine you start from the E8 point. You can ask about how does the spectrum evolve as a function of the other magnetic field, and what are their lifetimes, and how do they drop out of the spectrum? Okay. So uh, I think Giuseppe Massado and Delfino looked at this. And so there are semi-classical predictions for how this evolves uh, as a function of parameters. So in fact, one, one of the things I actually asked one of uh, my uh, DMRG friends was actually, could you map out this full spectrum of excitations of the Ising model in both a longitude and on a transverse field to do precisely that, to understand how you go from the E8 spectrum uh, to the linear confinement regime. Okay, but to the best of my knowledge, it's not been done in... I mean, it's just you, you don't have an exactly solvable model, so there's, there's entry points, but in general it's a, it's a difficult one to crack unless you do it numerically. Yes. And after experimentalists to really know what they're doing. Yes. Uh, and you made the comment uh, when you use an analogy or the hot core analogy to the duality application that the Hamilton is not so well known there. So would you expect it much, much harder to get such a agreement? Okay. So, so, so very good. Okay. So, so let me tell you then a little bit about the conclusions that I'll try to draw from, from my next talk. Okay. So basically, we were trying to understand uh, relativistic uh, transport, okay, close to quantum phase transitions. Okay. And you can determine these using, you know, standard, I wouldn't say standard field theory tools, as I'll explain, but kind of variants of, of more standard approaches. Okay. But it turns out that actually when you look at the transport coefficients in this problem, there's all sorts of links between the transport coefficients, okay? which turn out, thanks to the work of uh, Subir and Sean, turn out to be consequences of relativistic hydrodynamics. Now, if you do ADS-CFT, okay, you see all of these relations because you have an explicit example where all of these 
things are built into the problem. Okay? And then with the benefit of hindsight, you can then look at relativistic hydrodynamics. Actually, I don't know which order they did it in. It might be an interesting question. Did you do the hydrodynamics first and then the Yang-Mills calculations, or was it the other way around? Both simultaneously. Okay, so fine. So there you go. So you've got an example of a solvable model that you're running in parallel with what you think is a more general approach. Okay? So these holographic models act like test beds to maybe flesh out more general overarching principles. Okay? So maybe before we got all of these exquisite examples of uh, 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 low dimensional materials or ultra cold atomic gases, you could argue that those Hamiltonians served a similar organizing pur purpose up until the point where they were just bona fidely realized and everything is absolutely bulletproof. So my feeling is, is that if there are connections between critical states of matter in two plus one dimensions, it could well be that holographic techniques can start to offer some organizing principles. And so it may be possible to make rather robust testable predictions that are somehow insensitive to the fact that you're dealing explicitly with some supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory. I mean, to give you an example in the case of the CFTs, if you look at uh, the properties of a CFT, if you know its scaling dimensions, you know uh, how it's, uh, if you know its operator context and how it falls into representations of the Virasor algebra, you can say how the correlation functions decay. But basically, all of these CFTs are described by one overarching framework. And yes, each CFT is somehow different, but it's different in a way which you understand. Okay? And so it could well be that if you look at this totality of uh, Yang-Mills theories, maybe they display lots of common uh, properties which you could tease out and maybe present to an experimentalist. Okay? So it's this aspect of universality, I think. What are the kind of broad brushstroke features that, that are just general properties of interacting quantum systems close to a critical point?